you, thank you, thank you. Oh, wow. So if you want to put up that first slide, that'd be great. And I have a couple announcements to make regarding this book. First off, I, you know, last week I did present the first copy to Pastor Jack and Lynette and also to Stephanie. And, and with everything that was going on the weekend that Stephanie was here, I failed to mention that uh, the reason she got one of the first copies was that she had already written a book. And I did say that she is very inspiring to me. She just walks with the joy of the Lord and um, with excitement. She loves the Lord. And that's, you know, I, I look at her and, and listen to her talk, and I think, I want to be like her. <laughs> and then she had written two books, one on dreams, which I'm very interested in, and another children's book, which is absolutely wonderful. I think I've bought four copies. I've given one away. <laughs> one is to use with my grandchildren, and it's going to get all wrinkled up and maybe some torn pieces and slobber on it. And then I bought two more so they can have when they grow up because it's that good of a book to know uh, our Father who loves us so much. And we can be, be in relationship with him whenever we want, whenever we make time. And so she met with me. I reached out to her. I didn't know how to write a book. Uh, this really came about unexpectedly, although there's always <laughs> something in the back. You know, the Lord, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Uh, but the Lord knows. The Lord puts things in us from, you know, before any of our days come to be. And so our journey through life is an excitement to see what those things are that he put in us. So Stephanie, I, I reached out to her. I don't know what I'm doing. How do I publish a book? And so she met with me. She prayed with me. She gave me resources. And that was just a huge blessing to me to be able to get this completed. So she got an, a book. And uh, on the very first pages, I have to give thanks to my husband. And uh, without his help, Michael, would you please just stand for a moment? No, not everybody knows Michael. So Janet, <laughs> Janet saw me go back and kiss this guy back there. <laughs> I don't go around just kissing anybody. He is my husband. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, without his help. I mean, there were times when he's, I'm sure he's thinking, I was thinking, what am I doing? And you know, that is exactly what the enemy tells us. What do you think you're doing? You know, I've shared with some of you, as I've grown in dance, and I come and minister and dance, whether that's just all corporate or I do a special dance, often I'll go back to my seat, and then comes the condemnation. What, what do you think you're doing? That was awful. Who do you think you are? You know, so for a, a time, I had to struggle with that. But you know what? Thank God he never, ever leaves us. And as we keep pressing into him, he shows us how special we are to him and how much he loves us and adores us. He is not against us. He is for us. So now I've gotten over that. <clears throat> and when that voice tries to come in, I'm like, uh-uh, stop right there. <laughs> come no further. Praise God. So again, without you know, the Lord's help and Michael's patience, because it was a long journey. It took a long time to write this, and then you pass it on to editors and designers, and it's just it's stressful because you've never done it before. It's really, it's something else. And but the Lord was in it. He was faithful, and we got through it. And here we have the book. So praise God. The Lord has done a good work. Amen. And there's a special thanks in the book uh, for. Pastors Jack and Lynette and my mom, because they always encouraged me in my dance. And uh, even when I didn't understand it, especially Lynette, Lynette would see things that I didn't see. She would say, Carla, I see you doing this. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'll try. <laughs> and so I just, I thank God for you guys. And I thank God for you giving people here the freedom to grow in your gifts, that it really is unique that people can grow in their gifts like they do here. So praise God. I love you guys. So uh, since I don't have the books available, they are supposed to show up at my house by 10 o'clock tonight, <laughs> just a day late. 
<coughs> but I will have them in a couple weeks. I'll be off with my husband next weekend for Father's Day. So <coughs> on the 26th, I will have the books, and um, we can, well, look some more at the books. But before then, I just want to give you a brief overview of what's in the book so you can get excited about it, and then I'll just share a little bit more about my journey in dancing and writing. So next slide. <coughs> So the, the book is broken down into three parts. And the first part is all the scriptures about dance. So these are all the chapters about dance. And like Pastor Jack said, they are short. Some of them are very, very short. But that's all they need to be. And I was thinking about which one is my favorite. Thank you. And I just I have a hard time picking. I have several favorites and a couple that are not my favorite, but there are definitely lessons to be learned in them. Probably my, I think I have four favorites. And I always love the first mention of something and the last mention of something. So the first mention is a dance of rejoicing. And that is Miriam's dance, which most of us are all familiar with. It was spontaneous. It was exuberant and joyful. And she led all the other women in dancing. And it's in Exodus 15.20. So the first mention of dance in the Bible is Exodus 15.20. It's really easy to remember the first and the last because the last one is 1525. Just add five more, which is the number for grace. I like numbers, too. <laughs> so uh, the dance of rejoicing, the Lord had brought the Israelites out of Egypt, out of slavery, and here they are at the Red Sea with the Egyptians chasing them. And I'm sure they're standing at the Red Sea, and you know, thank goodness there's a pillar of a fire or a cloud Whichever time of day it was, there's, there's some debate about whether it was at night or in the day. I don't know, but you know what? That pillar of fire or cloud, whichever it was, was their protection for the moment. But they knew the Egyptians were there. So the Lord didn't just part the sea. The Lord works through his children. And they're all screaming at Moses, Mo, what, what, what did you do? What, you brought us out here. We're all going to die. And Moses is like, Lord, what did you do? You brought us out and we're all going to die. And the Lord said, you do something. You reach out your hand with your staff over the waters. And when he took that step of faith, the waters parted. They went through on dry land. And when the Egyptians tried to follow through, the water closed back over them and destroyed all of them. So Moses and Miriam, in chapter 15, ha there's a song of Moses and, and Miriam. And at the end, it says that she took the tabret and she went, broke out dancing, and the women followed her. They were rejoicing and worshiping for what the Lord had done for them. It was miraculous. The last mention of dance in the Bible was also, it really is miraculous when you think about it. Um, the great rejoicing, the prodigal son, it's powerful, and even though it's a proverb, it applies to so many of us. Many of us have prodigals in our lives. We all know someone who has a prodigal. I have dear, close friends uh, with prodigals, and it's painful. As a parent, or even as a child uh, with another family member, it's painful to have someone who has turned away from the Lord and has left, thinking, I, I'm, I've got a better way. I'm going to do things my own way. Thanks, Dad. You know, off I go. And the heart of the father is that he never, ever gives up on his children. He is always waiting and watching, and he always has hope. And that's something that we get when we focus on the word. The word. God, Jesus is the word. And when we have the word in our lives, we always have hope. But too many times we're focused on the world. So what's the difference between the word and the world? One man and one letter. Take that L out and move on up <laughs> to the word. <laughs> So this son went to see what there was in the world. And it didn't take who knows how long it was. It could have been a couple years. Uh, who knows? It's just a parable, right? But we all have, can relate to it. 
And for a time, the son was in the world. And finally, things got so desperate for him that he thought, what am I doing here? You know, I need to humble myself and go back home to my father. And when he did, the father who had been trusting and who had been patient and who had hope that someday the son would come back, he probably saw the clouds coming. Oh, here comes my son. You know, there's dust up there. Somebody's coming. And he knew in his heart it was his son. So he, um, he went chasing, running out to greet his son and embraced him. He got, he got a beautiful coat for his son to put on and a beautiful ring. And he said, you know, kill the fatted calf. We are having a celebration. And when the older son, who had stayed with the father, came in from the fields, he heard the music and the dancing. So did, have you ever thought about, about that? Can you hear dancing? I think you can. Yeah, you can. So I'm not going to go into what the older brother's Reaction, I think most of us know, and, and you can read about it in the book, but I want to focus on the joy yeah. of the father that the son had come home. And he just, it didn't matter what the son had done, what the son, where the son had been. It, nothing, none of it mattered. The only thing that mattered was that the son came home. And, of course, David's dance is one of my favorites. <laughs> Uh, chapter 7, David gets two chapters because he is so influential, uh, but chapter 7 is David's dance where he, and I know most of you probably know the story, and I want you to read the book. I won't go through it too much, but his, his dance was appropriate. <laughs> there is controversy out there as to what he was wearing. Read the book. <laughs> he was wearing priestly garments. I'll just give you that. And uh, he danced with all his might because he loved the Lord so much and he loved, he, he was so happy to be bringing the Ark of the Covenant back home to his city and uh, to honor the Lord. And he, d he could not hold anything back. In fact, I would like to share a little story. When I first came here, how many of you have been here for more than six years? So a few of you, knew me when I came, <laughs> and uh, I would not have come up here and danced like I did today. <laughs> but my special friend and guest, Jen, also attended here at that time. And I would sit back there, and yes, I would worship. I would put my hands up a little bit. I love the Lord. And then my friend Jen broke out in dance and she went skipping up the aisle and on the outward I was like oh I love the Lord I'm not praising the Lord on the inside I was like oh, I can't believe she just did that <laughs> and then a little uh, some time later she did it again so I went to her it, and I'd already received a word about me dancing and I was not walking in it but um, <clears throat> she did it again, and I went up to her. I'm like, Jan, how can you do that? And she just shared with me how much she loved the Lord, that when she's worshiping him, she just couldn't help but not to break out with joy, rejoicing, and dance. And it, it strengthened me. It strengthened me to what the Lord had for me to step into in my near future. So thank you. I love you. Thank you for being here, Jan. <laughs> But David's dance was fabulous. And uh, the last one I think I'll touch on is God's Dance of Joy, chapter 12. That comes from Zephaniah 317. Uh, Zephaniah is a really tough book. It's only three chapters long, but it's really, really tough. The Israelites had been, uh, they'd really turned away from the Lord, and God was angry with them. They were supposed to be his chosen people, and he was going to show all the blessings of a godly, holy, heavenly father to these people. But they turned away from him, and they went and worshipped other idols. And so Zephaniah 3 is about uh, what God was, was speaking to Zephaniah the prophet. Tell my people, this is what's going to happen because of their disobedience. God always warns us. God always tells us what he's going to do and why. And 
with all the horrific things that many people may reject the Bible for in the Old Testament, it's always because of their sin. It's because they turned away from him and they went to their own ways. So the first two and a half chapters are pretty, pretty awful. But then we get to the, the last part of chapter three, and God is merciful, and he's so full of grace, and he's so full of love. He always saves a remnant. He always gives us a chance to turn back to him. And I actually want to read this for you. Zephaniah 3. Now, the dance verse is in verse 17, but I'm going to start at verse 14. This is about his remnant coming back to him and being restored. God loves, he restored his prodigal son with no mention of where he'd been, what he'd done. And he does the same for us. He restores us with no mention of where we've been and what we've done. Verse 14. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exult wholeheartedly, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishments. He has turned back your adversary. It was the adversary that drew them away in the first place. The king of Israel, Adonai, the Lord, is in your midst. Never again will you fear harm. On that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, have no fear, Zion, no fear. Do not let your hands fall limp. Adonai, your God, is in your midst, a mighty Savior. He will delight over you. He will quiet you with his love. He will dance for joy over you with singing. And another explanation of the singing is a joyful shout. So I thought about that. I thought, okay, for many of us women, you know, we might tend towards, oh, yes, we like the singing. Sing over me, Lord. Oh, I love that beautiful song. But come on, guys. You know, we got guys in the room, too. It's like they might prefer the joyful shout. Yes, yes son. I'm so proud of you. Good job. You know, you've come back. I, I love you. And don't, you know, the past is the past. It is buried and gone. Amen. Amen. So that's just a touch on the first part of the book. So if we go to the next slide, I'll show you the next two parts, which are much shorter. The second part of the book is uh, God's inexhaustible word. Now, as I was studying to write this book, you know, the first few times you read through the Bible, it's like, okay, I didn't really remember a whole lot from that, but there were some good things in it. And so you keep reading and reading and reading. There's like a, a surface understanding of the Bible. But you can never outlearn God. And his word is living and active. So your entire life, as you read and reread, and just as Joan shared earlier, you know, how much she gets out of the Torah por portion, reading that every week, we'll never reach to the wisdom and knowledge that God has put in there. So as I was studying, digging deeper, I thought, okay, well, this word praise is repeated over and over and over, and also rejoicing is repeated over and over. What does that exactly mean? So we've translated the Bible into English, and any time you have a translation, you lose a lot of the understanding from the original language. So if you don't have a concordance, and you want to know more about what God's Word says, get a concordance. It is, it is incredible to dig into the deeper meanings of God's Word. So when I looked up the foundations of praise and rejoicing and even celebrate, those are songs that or words that when you look into the original Hebrew Greek uh, or Aramaic words, they're rich. They, there's all these, I think there was like something like 19 words for praise that we just condensed down into that one little word. And I know I spoke on praise some time back, but just for an example, David's dance comes from the word halal. And halal means to be clamorously foolish. So... <laughs> If some of what people might see online or, or visitors see going on here, uh, that's halal, which, which is the root for hallelujah. hallelujah. Be clamorously foolish and make a loud, clear noise. So we can rejoice like that before the Lord, and it is acceptable. Another word for praise is the word yada, and that means to use your hands. 
It means to extend your hands out in worship and honor. And it also means to throw your hands like an arrow. And we do those things when we worship and praise the Lord with dance. Another uh, word for praise is tehla, which is a verbal expression of praise. Sometimes it's through a song like a hymn or a word of encouragement, and we are praising the Lord with our mouth. And I think if I can remember the last one, I think it was simka, something similar to that. And it, it's a loud shout. And all those words we translate into praise. So when we study his word, uh, we, we grow so much more, we learn so much more. And that's what uh, the second part of the book is. The third part of the book is uh, growing in, in the Lord. <laughs> the, the call, when he calls you, you developing your gift, and the effect that dancing with freedom and with joy to the Lord does have an effect on other people. I'm going to cover dance in flags. And, um, and then number five, public ministry. Because a lot of times with me, I had to go through a big process of growing and learning before I could minister in public like I do now. And I got a phone call from a friend. And she asked, well, the, co the conversation turned towards clothing. Because when you're in public ministry, you do have to pay attention to your clothing. And she asked me if that was in the book. And it is mentioned uh, in chapter five. And, of course, Stephanie was the inspiration for Chapter 6, Welcoming the Children, because she just loves children, and she's written the children's book. So there's so many. And, and well, then, of course, it's 7 is my personal uh, testimony. And then 8 is encouragement for you to go dance your dance. And it may not be a physical dance like I do, but whatever your gift is, it's a dance to the Lord. You know, I think of Lynette and Jan and anybody else who plays the keyboards, I watch you guys sometimes and, and watch your hands just flying across those keys. And all I think of is, that's a dance. They are doing a dance, you know. Um, okay, I know there's a few fishermen in the house. <laughs> Fly fishing, any kind of fishing, you know, boating, that's a dance. And you are just loving and enjoying God's nature. And uh, whatever it is you do, in my mind, I think of it as a dance. So that is the book in a nutshell. And again, I'm sorry, in a couple weeks, uh, I hope to have the copies. It is available on Amazon, but I will have it. Uh, actually, when I bring it in a couple weeks, that is my first fruits to the church. So whatever you want to pay for the book, it goes to the church. And then after that, it'll be available at a discounted rate, or you can get it on Amazon for the full price. <laughs> So I'd like to share a little more about my journey. One more slide. So I want you to know, because it's something I had to learn, is that God knows the plans he has for you. For I know the plans that I have in mind for you, declares Adonai, plans for shalom and not calamity, to give you a future and a hope. So this was huge for me. So before the book came about, of course, there was dance. Before the dance came about, there was a prophetic word. And way before the prophetic word came about, the Lord had already put it in me. He already knew the plans he had for me. He knows the plans that he has for you, and they are for good. And the word shalom, I love the word shalom in this version. It's so much richer than peace. You know, we think peace is like, oh, okay, okay. I have rest for a moment. Shalom is prosperity in all areas of your life. Peace and prosperity in all areas. So I love that. That's what God wants for each one of us. And he's not pouring out calamity in our lives. That is not from him. He has good things for us. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you prophet to the nations. Now here he's speaking to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1.5. Jeremiah was a young prophet, 
and he did not really want to speak what the Lord was giving him. He was a little nervous. He was scared. He wasn't sure. Everyone was against him. Everyone was against the Lord at that time, and God picked Jeremiah, and in his unsureness, God confirmed, this is what I've appointed you for, and it's amazing that God even told him, they're not going to believe you, what you say. I'm going to tell you what to say. <laughs> You're going to say it. They're not going to believe you, but, but don't worry. Don't fear. Don't be in fear. I know the plans that I have for you. I will bring you through it, and I will bless you. And he has that for each one of us. He's, he's, he has appointed each one of us as something. And I didn't know it for a long time, but I was appointed to, to worship him with dance. Uh, so back in 2001, so my friend Diane is here. <laughs> Diane and I go way back. We attended another church together. And at a women's retreat, I had just started attending this church. I still lived in Denver and was commuting from Denver to this church. And went on the first women's retreat. And I uh, was receiving prayer and had shared some things. And then there was this other woman on the other side of the room come to find out uh, we had were in very similar circumstances. So that we got together that first year and started a Bible study for women. And we went about three years, I think, uh, ministering to women in that church. It was a really powerful time. I don't know who got more out of it. Probably, I, I do know, she and I got more out of it than maybe some of the other women, but I know it also affected their lives in a positive way, too. So uh, Diane walked through with me through a lot. She's been, she really was a rock for me at times and uh, loved me through some difficult times, encouraged me, and uh, I just am thrilled to have her here today to see where I've come from, how far I've come. So Diane, I just bless you. I love you so much, and thank you for all that you fed into me. So the second year, I went to the retreat again, and, and I think Diane was there. And that is when there was a prophetic psalmist ministering. Some of you know her, Mary Lindo. And again, it's, I'm still living in Denver. I didn't really know these women that well. Uh, so Mary was singing along, what, doing what she does. The Lord gives her songs, and she sings them out. And then she pointed me out for a song, and she said, the next one is for you. And she sang this beautiful, beautiful song about dancing. And I was just like... <laughs> Really? Uh, at first, I was like, okay, I'm looking around. Uh, does she get the right person? Do you dance? I don't dance. I'm and then the more she sang, one of the verses that she sang in the song was that when you dance, the Red Seas in life will part. And then other words were just put one foot in front of the other. And I thought, okay, well, that's, what I, that's all I can do because I don't know how to dance. But the, you know, I did have troubles in my life. I was struggling in certain areas of my life. And so I thought, okay, okay, Lord, this is how I get over these insurmountable problems is that I dance for the Lord. After the song, when the session was over, all these women came up to me, oh, we're so excited for you. Come to this meeting and dance and come here. And like, you know, you can dance here. And I'm like, ah, no, I don't think you understand. <laughs> like, this is between me and the Lord. <laughs> I will dance with the Lord, but that's as far as it goes. So that's what I did for the next 10, 15 years. And through a series of church changes and growing in other ways and healing, um, the Lord did a work in me. So one more psalm, and then we'll move to the next slide. Your eyes saw me when I was unformed, and in your book were written the days that were formed when not one of them had come to be. Psalm 139, 16. There's more proof that the Lord knows all about our lives. He planned our life before he formed us. Now, we have the ability to not walk in his ways. We can reject what he has for us, the days that he's planned for us. If we want to walk in, the, in what he has for us, we have to seek him. We have to live in the word and not the world. So prophecy and spiritual gifts. I got ahead of myself a little bit about the prophetic words. Uh, but let me go over this, these verses. Now, there are various kinds of gifts, but the same ruach or spirit. There are various kinds of service, but the same Lord. 
There are various kinds of working, but the same God who works all things in all people. But to each person is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the benefit of all. So whatever it is that uh, the Lord has put in us, it's not just for us. It is for other people. It is to, to worship him and to bless other people. We have gifts that differ according to the grace that was given to us. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith. If service, in our serving. Or the one who teaches, in his teaching. Or the one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who gives, in generosity. The one who leads, with diligence. The one who shows mercy, with cheerfulness. So this shows us that there are many different spiritual gifts. And we all have some form of spiritual gift. And we have different, I shouldn't say different amounts, but it's according to our faith. So our faith is something, if we can go to the next slide, our faith is something that, that we already have. Um, God, so God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So all of our gifts are spiritual gifts. God is a spirit. What he puts in you, it's spiritual. So that seed that he put in me for dancing, before I even knew it, it was spiritual. It's not an actual seed, it's spiritual. So I have to walk with him in spirit and truth. I don't under, always understand it, but if I seek him rather than the world, there's a huge difference between dancing for the word and dancing for the world. And if I walk with him, he will bless me. I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. So when you're serving him, when we're seeking him and how to use our gifts, we're all, we all use our bodies no matter what we're, we're doing. It's, it's our bodies. And that is our spiritual service to God. Now is the pruning and the healing. I went through a time of pruning and healing, and that was, it was a long journey, and I didn't understand I was going through it at the time, but uh, one of the, well, this is Ephesians 4.31, I think that is ne one of my life verses, one of them, it's get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and quarreling and slander along with all malice. How can God use us if we're doing all those things? You know, that, that takes me back to the prodigal son for a moment. A lot of times, things are done to us by other people that hurt us and make us angry, and we just we want to we want to return malice towards them, and we want to harm them the way they've harmed us. And that's a difficult thing to overcome. But when you think of the prodigal son, the prodigal son was probably out there doing all those things. When we're in the world, we end up serving ourselves, and we hurt people by doing that. But when we change, when we seek the word rather than the world, it becomes about him and glorifying him. And then the things that we do are a help. But remember the father's heart towards the prodigal son was that he received him with no condemnation. And he wants us to have the same heart. You know what? The person that hurt you, that's somebody's son or daughter. Their parents are probably praying for them to come home or to change their, their ways. So us, as children of God who know him, we have got to get rid of all of our bitterness, rage, and anger, and quarreling. And uh, that can take years. <laughs> but uh, God's brought me a very, very long way. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your father forgive your transgressions, Mark, Matthew 6, 15. And Christ died once for all. You know, when we hang on to that bitterness and expect someone else to continually come back to us and grovel and repent over and over again, you know, w w that's not being Christ-like, you know. I think of the things that have happened in my life, the things that I've done. And so, sometimes we think, well, you don't know what they did. What they did was worse than what I've done. Okay, well, would we want to just play everything out on a video for everyone to see and then let other people decide? I don't want that. I, the things I've done, I don't want it shown. 
You know, I, I thank God that he is so merciful. Love covers a multitude of sins. And if his love covers my sins, they, his love also covers the sins of those who've hurt me. And I have to let it go to glorify him. Amen. One more slide. So uh, after a journey of healing, then we get to how do we trust, how do we have faith, how do we walk in obedience. So really to heal, the healing process, the pruning and the healing, healing is a time of um, that, like the seed in you is sprouting, and for it to grow, you have to be healthy and whole. So as you get healed, then that seed that the Lord has put in you starts to grow and then comes the pruning, and then it's getting big. Your seed, the seed in you is expanding and getting bigger. It's like the, um, the uh, mustard seed, which I'll get to in a little bit. It's pretty, the mustard seed, you know, it's a small seed, but there's more to it. That's a, it's a powerful seed. So uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. So when we are walking in confusion and we don't know which way to go, focus on the word and not the world. He will show you your path. He'll make it straight. But if we're still operating over here in the world, we get confused. We don't know which direction we're supposed to go. But God hath dealt to every man a measure of faith. So we have to, we all have faith. And I think a lot of times we think, that God gives different, we see someone else who's got a lot of faith, and we think, wow, they've got so much faith. How come I didn't get as much? You know, we think God's handing out faith like, oh, you get this much. You're going to do great things. And okay, I'll give you this much. You're going to do some things. And, you know, oh, I'm really sorry, you poor little thing. I don't give you this much. No, that's not it at all. God has the measure of faith. We all have the same amount of faith that he has put in us, but we have to make it grow. It's up to us to make it grow. So we have gifts that differ according to the grace that was given to us, if prophecy in proportion, proportion to our faith. So how do you increase your faith? Next one. Faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Messiah, Romans 10, 17. Now, this verse is interesting because uh, we, we learn by hearing the word of God. In this verse, I don't like where the comma is. <laughs> I want to, like, move that comma so it says hearing and hearing, hearing and hearing and hearing, over and over and over, hearing and hearing and hearing by the word of God. We have to hear the word of God over and over and over because it takes a long time to understand it. It takes a while to get into us so that it is actually fruitful in us. But it does get there, and it's pretty exciting. So then the mustard seed faith, uh, he presented to them another parable, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. It's the smallest of all seeds, yet when it's full grown, it's greater than the other herbs. It becomes like a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. So th it mentions that it's the smallest of seeds, but it's not the size of the seed. It's the power that is in the seed. Even though this seed is the smallest, it grows into the biggest of herbs, and it provides shelter and comfort and all the things that, that the birds need. You are like that seed. You have a seed in you, and as it grows, you've got to seek the word so that it can grow to its full potential, grow to its full power. If we stay over here, we're going we're gonna to misuse it, and we won't receive that, that full potential and power that comes from that little tiny seed that was planted in us from the very beginning before one of our days came to be. So the last chapter in the book is Go Dance Your Dance. You know, we each have a dance, and we have to be obedient to what the Lord has called each one of us to. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. 
So we have to know from the Lord what our gift is. And a lot of times, you know, the world will tell us, and they might have an, have an inkling, but, you know, it really was the prophetic word that moved me. And it was even more than just the dance. There, I received another word. A friend of mine went down to Colorado Springs, I think, to Dutch Sheets' church one time. Just spur of the moment, out of the blue, we knew there was a meeting going on. Hey, let's go. So we went down there, and we sat through this meeting. It was lovely and encouraging, and this gal was giving words to people, but it got late. It was probably 10.30, l- late at night, and we thought, you know, I had at least an hour. She had an hour and a half to get back home. So we decided to leave, and as soon as we stood up, the gal said, wait a minute, I was just going to give you a word. <laughs> so we sat back down, and she came over and ministered to us, and one of the words that she spoke to me was that, Good things would be said about you, and good things will be read about you. And at the time, I thought, great. (laughs) I have to die. (laughs) When I die, people will say, yeah, she was a nice gal. And, you know, they'll write in my obituary, she was a nice gal, you know. (laughs) And I had no idea that good things would be said, and good things would be read about me. So, uh, you know, don't despise prophetic words, you know, and it's okay if we put them on a shelf and we let them sit for years. We just trust, we know and trust that the Lord will bring it to life at the proper time. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist when the times are evil. And after you have done everything to stand firm, stand firm then. And maybe this is a little out of place because it should have been back at the point where I was growing in my gift and when I would sit down and the enemy would attack me. I had to learn to stand firm when he said, you're no good. That was terrible. And I had to learn to stand against it. And it's like, I'm going to listen to the word and not the world. Rejoice always, pray constantly, and in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Messiah Yeshua. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the prophetic messages, but test all things, hold fast to what is good, keep away from every kind of evil, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 21, and that's just exactly what, what I shared about, is standing firm. You know what the Lord has shown you, and it might take some time for it to come to pass, but it will come to pass, so stand firm and resist the enemy, live in the world, a word, not the world. And as I finish, I would like to read a couple chapters, or not chapters. Uh, sorry, you just all panicked, like, oh, <laughs> we're going to be here a while. <laughs> okay, chapter eight in the last section of Go Dance Your Dance. Each chapter starts with the scripture. So you, all of you, are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on a lampstand. So it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men so they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So as we end our time together, let's ask, how did David dance? David danced before the Lord with joy, with leaps, with all his might, with shouts, and with the sound of the shofar. He followed his dancing with sacrifices and offerings, generous gifts of food for the men and women of Israel, and blessings for his own household. He danced conspicuously and exuberantly. So let's go in the same style. And the closing prayer in the book. I will not read all of it, but I'll give you. If I can find it. I pray not on behalf of these only, but also for those who believe in me through their message. You all have a message. Jesus prayed that 
they wouldn't believe uh, only in him, but they would believe because of your message. Your message is going to draw people to him. Thank you for reading Dance Like David Danced. Maybe you picked up this book because you are already ministering to the Lord through dance or you have a strong desire to, and we're looking for a resource to help you grow. I hope these pages have done that for you. I hope you will read Dance Like David Danced more than once. Even more important than reading this book is reading his book. My prayer is that you have discovered how rich and applicable the Bible is in your life and for your life, and that Holy Spirit will stir up a passion in you for his word and his presence. And with God's help, may you live your fullest life in him. So it's in him that we give all the praise and the glory for, for everything that he's done for us, and he has put in us, and it's for him. He's so good. He is such a loving father who just pours out his love. All He's good, good, good. He's not against us. He is for us. And he wants to shout. He wants to sing. He wants to dance over us because of his joy over each one of us. So I hope this has encouraged you. And uh, when we get the books, I hope you get the book and read it. Thank you.